For the past 18 months, a global task force comprised of 17 leaders from the financial, technology, policy, regulatory and international development communities has been pondering some big questions about how financial technology could affect sustainability issues and the deeper questions surrounding the UN's Sustainable Development Goals. Now, the challenge before the panel was complex, but to describe it in simplified terms, the task force wanted to find out whether and how new digital technologies might be deployed to adjust the global financial system in such a way that would put economic power into the hands of people rather than institutions. And in doing so, it also wanted to find out if it could create more efficient ways for developing countries in particular to finance their economic development without having to rely on international institutions or even other governments. Well, the process came to a conclusion recently, and the report of the UN Secretary General's Task Force on Digital Financing of the Sustainable Development Goals is now available online. And as with all such high-level panels and reports, there is a great deal of deep thought and fine detail contained in it. So to get a layperson's explanation of the exercise, of its purpose and its conclusions, I spoke recently to Simon Zadek, who was the head of the Secretariat panel. Simon, thanks very much indeed for talking to me. Very good to chat with you as well, Timor. So this was an 18-month process um, that you've just undertaken and just completed. I don't want to go through the entire machinations of uh, what you began with, how the process went and who participated. I want to get straight into the, the meat of your conclusions uh, and the action that hopefully it will spur. And let me quote to you here something that you mentioned, or one of the quotes within the report, which you talked about a systemic opportunity to change how development finance works. Can you explain to me what that means? Sure. So global financial markets, 350 trillion US dollars, depending on the time of day. Um, public finance, roughly you know, 20% of global GDP. So huge flows of funds around the world, you know, seeking public good and private gain. Um, what are the principal disruptors of those flows? Uh, clearly, the pandemic, uh, the financial crisis of 2008, uh, all really good examples of uh, finance and economies being turned upside down. But perhaps underpinning that or underlying that is a deeper disruption that is coming to finance and money. And that is the impact of digitalization. But why, why, do, why do we want to disrupt how the finance flows and why do we need a systemic change here? So if we go back a step, you know, why is why is finance being disrupted? It's being disrupted because digitalization uh, changes the speed that it flows in. Uh, it changes the uh, volume and timeliness of data that can be used in directing those flows. It drives financial instrument innovation, new financial institutions, new markets new governance and regulation. That has nothing at all per se to do with sustainable development. That is a process underway. Tomorrow, the world's largest financial institutions will not be the HSBCs and the JP Morgans of this world, but will be emerging through new codes that are underpinned by digital technology, um, not necessarily with a history of banking or asset management or pension funds. Um, that's going on in any case. That, that, then the question is, why does that interest us? It interests us because today, financial flows are far from aligned to people's collective interests, which we can uh, perhaps summarize in terms of the UN's uh, 17 sustainable development goals, equality, uh, anti-poverty, uh, climate change, biodiversity, you know, livelihoods, and so on. <clears throat> and today, mm. financial flows um, actually drive some of those agenda items forward, but in many instances, don't take account of those effects. Uh, and so we're interested in shifting finance, whether it be public or private, in ways that more effectively lead to finance 
supporting the realization of those goals or SDGs. All right. Well, I mean, let me let me let me just quote you something else that's in the report: leveraging digitalization to empower citizens to recover effective control and make a critical difference in financing the SDGs. So just to fold that into what you said, I mean, your your implication in this being that the existing systems, including the JP Morgans and the HSBCs, are perhaps not doing the role that you think they should do, which is empowering the citizens and uh, using their own disruption, if you like, and their own digitalization process in the manner that you think is most appropriate to SDGs. Kristalina Georgieva, the current managing director of the International Monetary Fund, makes the observation, it is time that the financial system is aligned to its own purpose, which is to serve the people who are the ultimate owners of capital, and that is us, not the intermediaries, the banks, the insurance companies, and the pension funds. Um, And I think it is reasonable to argue that certainly since the mid 70s, many aspects of our global financial system has become detached, if you like, from people's interests and the interests of those who own the money that is used. Uh, It's not a coincidence that the task force report is called people's money because it is focused on how and if so, in what ways digitalization can re-empower citizens as savers, as lenders, as investors, as insurers, as taxpayers, as voters in how their money is used. Think of public finance, just to illustrate the point. Um, We have 20% of global GDP roughly made up of public financial flows. Um, Those flows are made on behalf of citizens of countries that governments uh, act in, but to what extent really are those flows accountable to the voters who pay their taxes? Digitalization can dramatically increase the transparency of public financial flows. It can increase the accountability for each and every cup of coffee that a minister chooses to spend on my bill as a taxpayer of a particular country. Similarly, in the mainstream private financial sector, do we really know what banks are doing with our savings? Are those lending operations really in our interest? Actually, not only don't we really know what they're doing as individuals, but we know collectively that the banking community is not channeling our savings effectively into long-term development finance. So there are two two elements I see in, in what you've just said then, Simon. Firstly, that the institutions and the processes and the paths through which this finance flows uh, need perhaps adjustment to rebalance in favor of the citizen rather than the institutions themselves. Uh, but you're also talking just at the end there about the, uh, the, where the money itself comes from uh, and what money it is that we are talking about that is being used for that development. Uh, and the Asian Development Bank had its annual general meeting this month and the idea of domestic resource mobilization was brought up in that. We had a, an IMF member talking about that. But the, the conversation there centered a lot about around the idea of how one raises and manages tax revenue. I get a sense that what you're talking about in this report does not see that as the primary source of the money. It's amazing that the words domestic resource mobilization have been co-opted by the international development community to mean tax raising. Whereas, of course, it shouldn't mean that at all. It should mean how do we ensure that a country's wealth and income is deployed effectively through financial markets and the public purse in ways that deliver development finance outcomes. So just the language itself, if you like, illuminates the fact that the development community doesn't really think about the individual as having any agency over how its money is used. May I give an example? Um, In the case of Bangladesh, an area, a country that we have engaged with as part of the task force process, Bangladesh needs something in the order of 60 to 80 billion US dollars a year for long-term infrastructure investment and is securing about half of those funds from international sources today. 
Uh, at the same time, when you look at Bangladesh's domestic savings, it has increased by many fold over the last 20 years, a sign of success. But the most recent estimates are that only 6% of those domestic savings are flowing into long term domestic development finance. So think about digitalization in that context. The opportunity exists, and this is the work now going on in Bangladesh, to channel those domestic savings using almost costless aggregation mechanisms provided by mobile devices, not into the banking community or into the general fiscus, government coffers, if you like, but separately right. into financial instruments that can then be used to deploy funds into long-term infrastructure investment. The implications of that, just before you jump in, are profound. Instead of the Bangladesh government having to seek international capital or indeed having to drag more domestic resources into the general tax coffers, we have the opportunity of bypassing both of those mechanisms and turning domestic savers, the individual taxi driver in Dhaka who saves 20 US cents a week into an investor in infrastructure that is of interest to him or her. So what you're talking about here is, is actually a, a, a unique moment in history where um, it's not just Bangladesh, right? A lot of the developing nations are creeping up the income ladder. Bangladesh itself will be middle income uh, country fairly soon. So we, we've got pools of domestic savings growing up in a large number of the developing countries. What you're saying is that instead of borrowing money from the rich countries, these countries should be tapping into their own citizens' savings uh, and mobilizing that capital. But, I mean, it seems to make sense on, on the face of it. Are they doing so or are they not doing so? And what has this report done to catalyze that activity? So, you know, there are reasons why one taps international capital. And so this is not a binary option. You know, one seeks US dollars, if you like, as Bangladesh or other countries, if one needs to purchase things from external sources, the needs for foreign exchange. But, but actually, much of infrastructure development doesn't require Forex. Uh, it requires funds, but those funds can be domestically mobilized. So firstly, this is not an either or, but if you like, an optimization between domestic savings, domestic resources, and international resources. Secondly, there are, of course, domestic resources being mobilized through the fiscus or indeed through you know, private bond issuance uh, in many developing countries into infrastructure development. But most developing countries have relatively weak capital markets, leaving them dependent on a banking system that is often not well suited and actually not terribly interested in channeling domestic savings into long-term development finance. Look at most balance sheets of most banks in most countries. What sits there? You know, it's a bunch of corporate working capital lending, perhaps a little bit of capex. Yeah, it's a bunch of mortgages. Yeah, it's a bunch of lending to government and very little by way of long-term development finance, let alone effective SME lending. Uh, and so the banking community mm. is not well suited to intermediate at a moment where what one really needs is much longer term time horizons for investment. Um, sorry. So I was going to say, isn't isn't that the essence of the problem? I mean, what we have here is the old analogy of the super tanker changing direction. We have a financial system that's been built up since World War II in certain interests and along certain lines and following a certain path. And what we're now considering is how do we move that super tanker around? And as you said, a lot of countries simply don't have the infrastructure in order to make that happen. So, you know, your, your report considers all these issues in, in considerable depth. But just to go back to my previous question, how does this report uh, differ from a fairly standard study like this, which will usually come up with insights and recommendations? How do we move from that point to actually making the changes that are necessary to capitalize on the insights that you've had? So the task force does three things. First of all, it highlights 
five catalytic opportunities that are in the multi-trillion dollar space and gives practical advice and guidance on how digitalization can support uh, tapping these large opportunities. The domestic savings example that I've given writ wide across many countries is one of those cases. Secondly, it makes a series of recommendations that have to do not so much with those market opportunities, but if you like the DNA of how digital finance ecosystems are developing at the domestic level, what needs to be done, you know, the role of data, you know, different forms of domestic governance and what is happening internationally, maybe something we can come back to. And then thirdly, um, it has helped to catalyze a number of what we have called Pathfinder initiatives that are on the ground and that exemplify how ambitious action can be taken in availing themselves of the opportunities that we've highlighted. Could I give one small example of that to complement the Bangladesh case? Let, let me let me just clarify the idea of Pathfinder. So what you're talking about here is that the you're, you're not just talking about theoretical frameworks. There are actually a couple of, or more than a couple, uh, of real-life activities that have taken place on the basis of the information that you're providing and are in, in real action. These path for, Absolutely. These Pathfinder initiatives have, in fact, evolved in parallel, led in every case by either members of the task force or members of the task force in conjunction with other partners. Uh, inspired, catalyzed, and informed by the work of the task force. Okay, so Bangladesh was one of them, um, and you have another. I can give several, but let me start with one more. Um, one of the challenges in most developing countries, and indeed in many developed countries, is providing funding not just for small and medium-sized enterprises, SMEs, but providing debt and equity funding uh, for fast growing, high potential growth companies, you know, which of course we see, you know, in California maybe, or in Hangzhou in China, but how does one do that in Zimbabwe where that kind of risk capital doesn't flow in large part because the analytics, the risk analysis is not in place. So, so Zimbabwe's leading payment platform, Echo Cash, uh, of which the CEO, Natalie Jabungwe, has been a member of the task force, has built what is today a unique stock exchange, um, but a stock exchange that has taken an approach that I think in years to come will be replicated across the world. Their stock exchange uses payments data to build due diligence and credit ratings. <clears throat> thereby allowing in a country that is in many ways in fraught economic circumstances to provide the analytic clarity and data flows that allows risk venturers to invest debt and equity in high growth potential companies in Zimbabwe. So New York Stock Exchange or London Stock Exchange or Shanghai or Hong Kong would never consider using payments data, you know, the payments data of what people buy and sell from SMEs to build credit ratings that would be relevant in capital market transactions, investing debt and equity in high growth, high risk companies. And that's exactly what Zimbabwe has done. How did this happen? Just to make the connection back to the task force, Natalie Jabungwe, as I've said, the CEO of EcoCat sits on the task force, but so does Brad Kutsayama, uh, made famous in Michael Lewis's book, Flash Boys, uh, who has initiated a highly innovative um, uh, equity trading platform in New York. And so Brad sitting on the task force, really not working in Zimbabwe at all, you know, Natalie sitting on the task force, really not connected into the New York, you know, capital intensive ecosystem, connect the dots, supported further by the UN and moves ahead with this quite unique stock exchange in Zimbabwe. Interesting point that you made about the data. Um, now, 
the reason why the New York Stock Exchange isn't using that data, presumably, and a lot of countries are not moving along these lines already, are because of international concerns. Data is not only the new oil, as the cliche goes, but also uh, an extremely delicate and politically explosive sort of area. Is it possible that the situation in Zimbabwe can be replicated across the rest of the world, given the fact that political economies at a national level and an international level have so many different aspects and so many different levels of regulation and, uh, and ethical behavioral codes involved in them. How does one get past all of these obstacles towards reforming the financial system? Yeah, I mean, there are two parts of an answer to that. Firstly, the New York Stock Exchange doesn't use payments data because it isn't part of a financial and data ecosystem where data is being drawn from the consumer and retail end, what Amazon, for example, is doing, into capital markets. These are innovations that are happening principally in developing countries where incumbent institutions are not in control of the way capital markets are developing. So this is before we get to the privacy and regulation and policy issues. So in China, for example, the country's second largest lender to the SME community is Ant Group, the Alipay, like PayPal, spin-off of Alibaba, like Amazon, if you like. Uh, and they're using sophisticated algorithms to deliver low cost, you know, very rapid lending to the SME community. This isn't replicated effectively in Europe and North America, not because it's not technically possible and not because of policies and regulations, but because incumbents have split up and divided the way in which financial markets work um, to make it extremely difficult for breakthrough initiatives of that kind to happen. Notwithstanding that point, your observation is correct. Yeah, there are many data privacy issues that are being particularly evolved out of Europe, but now also the US and elsewhere, <clears throat> that will complicate the easy movement of data between different different actors within the financial system and across multiple uses. The challenge actually is quite interesting in that context. Is the regulatory model that evolves going to unintentionally, by making it more and more difficult to move to use that data, create monocultural monopolies of that data? Um, the larger organizations don't have to share that information. Yeah, they're not allowed to share that information. And so innovators are not able to get at that data and use it to drive innovation that can service the public good and their customers. Or will regulations emerge that are far more focused on open source and interoperability, as well as reinforcing the need for privacy and citizen ownership of data? Clearly second pathway so, is where we need to go, the interoperability. Otherwise, we are in danger of so-called big tech becoming monopoly controllers of large volumes of data and squeezing again the potential for innovation as digitalization progresses. So how, I mean, do you have or has the report proposed an answer to that very thorny conundrum. I mean, how do we make this possible and prevent big tech and indeed big finance from creating a system, a new system even, a digital system along the lines you're talking about, but one in which they still control the flow uh, and the profits from the monies involved and do not allow the empowerment of citizens? Yes, the war for data is certainly ongoing. Um, and the task force has pointed to both the need and practices in individual countries that can be effectively emulated elsewhere. The good news is that there is a huge amount of work, not only in the finance space, but more broadly in the digital space, focused on this nexus of privacy issues and citizen ownership of the economic value of data on the one hand, and interoperability to ensure that data can drive innovation in financial markets that are in the interests of citizens as consumers. So there is a huge amount of work in that area. 
and it is progressing uh, well, but under fraught circumstances with the two principal global market players as being effectively China through its ecosystem of fintech companies and digital companies uh, around the Hangzhou area and the equivalent in California in the US, uh, very little, frankly, happening in many other parts of the world to challenge some of the norms that those two giants are creating beyond possibly Europe, not well endowed with market leaders, but trying to push um, into the way in which markets globally are shaped, largely through the evolution of standards and regulation. Let me finish off with, with a, a long-term picture. I mean, you've spent 18 months on uh, examining and reporting on and concluding this report. Um, and I wonder, where do you think we are in the evolution that you have undertaken, the process of evolution? I, I, there was a quote from Hakim Steiner, one of the, the co-chairs of, of the committee, um, and I'm quoting him slightly out of context here, but, but, the, but the, the meaning is, is clear. He said, we have not begun to understand how transformative fintech can become. Uh, and I wonder whether uh, you think that this is the first step in an evolutionary process, not, not just in terms of getting the ball rolling, but in terms of the potential for transformation. Uh, and if, if it is the first step, what do you think happens next? In 1904, H.G. Wells, um, uh, a now dead, long dead science fiction writer, wrote a book called The Modern Utopia. And in it, he included a chapter on the nature of money. And he argued um, in quite a compelling and at that time very modern way that the value of money should be rooted in the value of energy and nutrition. Yeah, so he reconceived, if you like, how in a modern utopia, yeah, the nature of value should be shaped and coursed through the way in which money was used. Today, as we begin to crowd in more and more negative and positive externalities into the way markets function through a number of different means, digitalization allows us to capture more and more of that in the way in which finance works and in the underlying mechanisms of money itself. Yeah, a visionary perhaps forward look then, trying to leverage your point, would be that digitalization on a good day you know, will move us as a set of interrelated communities around the world towards a moment where finance and money reflects far more broadly, not only our objectives, but the negative and positive externalities that our financial transactions create. Um, now, to get from here to there is a long pathway and is by no means guaranteed simply because of digitalization. This requires policy intervention. It requires public campaigning. It requires negotiation between many different countries and regions of the world. So in conclusion, I would argue we are at the early edge of how digitalization could influence the way finance and money works and by its nature influence the way in which we invest in our futures. So we've talked a lot about the upside potential of digitalization, but what about potential risks? Are there any associated problems you see? Yes, I'm glad you've raised this. So clearly there are many and I wanted just to perhaps point to two different types. On the one hand, digitalization can lead to high levels of exclusion. Yeah, um, they can lead to algorithms that are biased against particular groups, women or particular minorities. Um, they can lead to increased short termism. They can lead to increased flows of illicit financial uh, flows if those can't be tracked effectively because of the rapid movement that they can engage in as a result of digitalization. So that's, if you like, one set of risks that need to be addressed. Um, but then there's a second set of risks, which is digitalization allows companies to go to scale very fast. Um, you know, in traditional economics, we think about, you know, increasing returns to scale, which eventually lead to reducing returns to scale. Uh, in the digital world, those reducing returns to scale simply 
aren't there. So you get this explosion of exceedingly large companies. Think of Amazon, think of Alibaba, think of Google, think of Apple and others. Um, part of what the task force has considered is the downside implications of these new, very large, big fintech operations and how that might be addressed at the governance level. And one of the Pathfinder initiatives that the task force has, if you like, spun off, co-chaired by our original co-chair, Achim Steiner, and also by Patrick Njoroge, who is the governor of the Central Bank of Kenya, is specifically convening actors from around the world, um, governors of other central banks in developing countries, some of the international organizations involved in the governance of financial markets to try and infuse a higher level of consideration of sustainable development goals in the way in which policy and regulation is defined for these large institutions going forward. My micro example of that, by no means micro, some of you will recall that Facebook has been seeking to push forward a global digital currency called Libra. Uh, and there has been a huge debate about the pros and cons of Libra and how it might be governed. The principal actors involved in the question of governance are those like the Fed, the US Central Bank, the European Central Bank, and one or two other actors who are principally concerned about financial stability and money laundering. But actually, initiatives like Libra will have far greater effects, particularly on smaller developing countries, hollowing out their monetary policy, potentially invading and neutralizing industrial strategy and economic strategy, not because they're malicious, but it's because of the way in which an international currency begins to neutralize the ability for sovereign states to manage their own affairs. This is not the fault of Facebook, but the potential implication of these large scale digital finance initiatives. And there is a need clearly, not only to rely on the Fed and the European Central Bank, which have a narrow mandate, but to bring in other actors to the governance process that have a broader perspective on sustainable development. Well, thanks for providing a, an introductory glimpse into what is a very in-depth report, Simon. And, and I uh, would like to talk more about what's happening in Bangladesh, in Zimbabwe, and your other Pathfinder initiatives. Unfortunately, we don't have uh, the time to do that, but I will look into those in, in greater detail, and hopefully we can cover more of those, and hopefully we'll learn more about those uh, from you uh, as the time progresses. But appreciate your uh, giving me this uh, insight into this, into this report, Simon. Thanks a lot. Brilliant. Thank you, Timor, very much.